Welcome back to the book club. I'm Michael Knowles. This month, finally, we are reading one of the most important books I've ever read, one of my favorite books, a book that is not by a modern liberal, not even by a classical liberal, but a work of political philosophy by an actual conservative. Edmund Burke, Reflections on the Revolution in France. But before we get to that, in our fast-paced world, it is tough to make reading a priority. At least it used to be. At thinker.org, we summarize the key ideas from new and noteworthy nonfiction, giving you access to an entire library of great books in bite-sized form. Read or listen to hundreds of titles in a matter of minutes from old classics such as Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People to recent bestsellers like Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. If you want to challenge your preconceptions, eh. If you want to, I don't know, expand your horizons, who cares? If you want to, now we're getting to something that really matters, sound smart at cocktail parties. You must go to Thinker, T-H-I-N-K-R dot org. Start a free trial and put your mind in motion. We will be putting our minds in motion with the great Edmund Burke. Here to help us do that is the great Yoram Hazoni, the author of The Virtue of Nationalism, the author of Conservatism, A Rediscovery, one of the great living conservative political philosophers. You do all sorts of things. You run the Edmund Burke Foundation. You've got a certain interest in this man. Yoram, when I was being brought up in politics, I was told that uh, there are modern liberals and classical liberals. And the classical liberals we now call conservatives. And everyone's a liberal of some sort or another. But not this guy. No, I think this guy is the anti-liberal. I, I mean, I, I know all sorts of people today want to confuse you, but if you want to see things the way that Edmund Burke saw them, he thought that there was the liberal, the liberal revolution, which was coming to uproot everything that we had inherited, everything that was uh, the Christian tradition, the biblical tradition, the, the British tradition, anything that was... Uh, virtuous and beautiful and excellent and good, he believed liberalism was going to destroy. And that's what that book is about. It, it sizzles in your hand, doesn't it? It, it does. I feel I'm, I'm so excited. I, my blood is up. For those who have not yet read the book, shame on you. Uh, but before you read the book, you can at least know this was a letter, right? This book, Reflections on the Revolution in France, Edmund Burke received a letter from a family friend in France asking him his views on the French Revolution. And he gave this person the longest reply that has ever been written in human history, a very long letter that became a book. It instantly became a bestseller. Edmund Burke very much disapproves of the revolution in France. Edmund Burke approved of the American Revolution, so he's not against all revolutions, but he said the revolution in France was terrible. It, he predicted that this would lead to terror. He said there will be blood. He predicted the rise of Napoleon, actually, long before, obviously, that ever happened. And he articulated a view of politics that is not merely about using our unfettered reason to discover all sorts of abstract rights floating in the ether, but a, a view of politics that's rooted in tradition, that's rooted in prescription, in prejudice, if I can even use a, a, a naughty word that no one's allowed to say anymore. What's his case? He's the philosopher of guardrails. You know, people today like to say, well, all the guardrails are coming off. So that's what he's talking about. He says, actually, human beings grew up within a certain society, and that society hands down, uh, let's call it a common sense, a certain way of evaluating things. Now, there, there are all sorts of uh, uh, principles that you can derive from your traditions, from scripture, from religion, from, from, from your na nation's history. There, there are principles. But his point is that when you're talking about principles, uh, freedom, equality, justice, uh, when, when you're talking about those things, it's not that they're not true. Of course they're true. The problem is that that when you try to build a, a political system just about people thinking about freedom or just about people thinking about justice, then you can get absolutely anywhere. Human reason will take you to every last crazy poisonous thing. And to, to see it, just look at the United States. Look at the people who are, who are waving the flag for justice right now, or even the people who are waving the flag for, for freedom. Just a lot of the time, they're talking about crazy things. Mm. And Burke says the difference between a, a sane and a totally cracked person 
who is concerned for freedom or for justice is whether he, he or she continues to uphold the guardrails that help guide us to understand what these terms mean. Otherwise, we just lose what they mean and they start to mean something else. So Burke is a very practical guy. He's not merely sitting and, and pulling these ideas out of his head uh, using his own unfettered reason. He's actually a practicing politician. He's a Whig member of parliament. Yep. He was Irish, but he's, you know, he's uh, considered an English figure, Anglo-Irish, I guess. And he supports the American Revolution. He opposes the French Revolution. What gives? He's very sympathetic to the American claims that, that what the king has done is to violate the traditional constitution, meaning the traditional British constitution and the traditional constitution that, that binds America to Britain. So Burke is on that side of the argument. He, he, he agrees with the colonists that what the king has done is to violate the constitution. When they declare independence, he goes silent. You, you, you can't find him, you know, saying, that a, go, Sign me up. Yeah, yeah, go for it, boys. Let's down with the king. That's, that's not Burke. If what, that's what yeah. you're looking for. But very important is that he's also pro-American. As soon as the American Revolution takes the turn in 1787, takes Washington and the Federalist Party's turn to basically adapting the British Constitution to American circumstances, which, which is what the, what the American Constitution is. When, when you get there, then he starts to speak out again. And he says, that's what you do, boys. That's the way to go. So um, it, it, in this pro-Americanism, um, which, which is strong but limited, yeah. um, he definitely sees something super positive that he doesn't see in the French Revolution. Because in the, Fr the French Revolution, the, the heart of the revolution is, is taking big ideas like uh, equality, liberty, fraternity, consent, justice, taking these big ideas, and then you, you put everybody in, in a, a, a single legislative house that, ha that has all the powers combined within it, and assuming that everybody can just reason directly from these big ideas to a better world. And Burke says, you know what? You put a bunch of people in a single parliamentary house, ask them to reason directly from all these big ideas to a better world, and they will create terror. They will create murder. They, they will, oceans of blood will be the result. And he compares that. He's, he's thinking that the Americans have these British traditions. Those traditions are, you know, 500, 800 maybe a thousand years old at the time. And he's saying, if those Americans, if they throw out their traditions, they'll be like the French. But if they go take the revolution back to something that looks like the British tradition, then they can do something well. Then it'll be good. So the, the idea is that what the Americans have done, at least by the time of the Constitution, is in a way, make themselves even more British, yeah. assert their rights and traditions as, as Brits, and, and take that tradition and apply it to these circumstances. And what the French have done is they've cast off their Frenchness. They've tried to undo their Frenchness, up, upend every institution, invent a bunch of rights out of thin air, and that leads to the blood and the terror. Yep. Now, he, he also writes, at, at the same time, there's a third revolution, the Polish Revolution, which most people haven't heard of. He also praises the, the the Poles, they had a traditional constitution which was dysfunctional. And in their revolution, they purposely move their constitution, they revise it so that it's more like the British one. And it's important that, that Burke supports that. In other words, he, he doesn't think that if you've inherited something that, that, you know, that's evil or dysfunctional, that you just have to you know, believe in whatever it is you've inherited. He thinks that a conservative is somebody who's trying to hold the thing together, hold the nation together and its traditions and its religion, but eventually it will come to, you know, bumps. It'll come to, to it, every tradition runs down. And then he speaks about something called restoration. And restoration means you look back to, uh, in your own tradition to see what can you update in order to fix things. And if you can't find it, like the Poles, then he even allows that, well, you might want to look at something that's worked really well for centuries for a different country. Mm. And, and the, the Poles imitating the British is to him a very positive thing. 
right? So, so the, this conservatism is not, it's not a blind, um, just, you know, I, I believe in whatever it is that's been handed down to me. My grandpa did it, so I'm gonna do it too. Definitely not that. But it, what it is, is something that is, is a, a look at politics that says, tradition is what holds us together. Tradition is what gives us wisdom. Tradition is what teaches us to know how to do things. And so we can't step outside of tradition and know how to do things. We need to stay in the tradition and fix it, repair it, restore it. And that's the art of the statesman for Burke. The way that so many American conservatives are taught to think about conservatism is that it's about freedom. It's just about more freedom. And the more freedom you have, the more conservatism it is. But you keep using this other word. You keep saying that it's tradition. There were people, you know, at the American founding, there were two parties. People pretend that there weren't, but yeah. there were. The, there was a, a radical revolutionary party, the Jeffersonians, Tom Paine, and, and, and Burke is responding to, to their, their friends in England. Yeah. There was a radical revolutionary party that gave birth to abstract liberalism. Uh, and there was a conservative party, a national conservative party. People like uh, Washington, John Jay, uh, a guy named Governor Morris, who, was, who drafted the Constitution, uh, John Adams, Alexander Hamilton. These five guys and their friends, they're the people who said, this revolution is, 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 is going out of control. If, 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 the, if we have 13 independent states with a, with, a, with a weak concocted central legislature above them, we'll never win a war, we'll, we'll never be able to raise taxes, we'll never be able to impose a peace, we'll, we'll kill each other. And very early on, George Washington, who really is the father of our country, you know, not Jefferson, right? right? He really is the father of the United States. Very early on in the war, Washington starts to say, look, we have to be nationalists. We have to unite under a strong government and that government's gotta look like the government in England. And uh, in the Constitution in 1787, when, when, when they get together and write the Constitution, that's what they do. They, they, they say uh, a, a strong unitary executive, a bicameral le legislature, which is responsible for taxation and legislation, uh, the executive veto, uh, the, the jury trial. I mean, you could just go on and on. All of these things are taken from, from, from the English Constitution. And they're not embarrassed to say these national conservatives, our future depends on us going back to something that's a lot like what we had from, from England. Now, this is even more confusing because I was always told growing up that the conservatives are for small government and the liberals are for bigger government. But what you're saying is at the founding of America, it was the conservative party, known as the Federalist Party, that was pushing for a relatively bigger government. Yep. How am I supposed to make sense of that? Well, look, I, I, I think it's true that if you took any of those Federalists and, and you showed them you know, the current American national government, you know, whatever, you know, four million employees and, uh, and a president who is incapable of, of, of doing almost anything because the bureaucracy constrains him, and, and a Congress which, which, you know, does almost nothing, and a Supreme Court which, together with, you know, the, 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 the bureaucracy basically makes all the decisions. So, um, so that's, that point is true, uh, that I, I don't think in their wildest dreams they imagined something like this. But, but if you look at the American founding and you ask what principles are most important, Je the Jeffersonians are saying indivi individual liberty is, is what it's about. He didn't even want there to be a constitution. Mm. He thought that you could just meet, you know, once every 20 years and figure out what, you know, something from scratch, something new. I mean, it's just completely against tradition. Right. Whereas the uh, Washington's party, um, they wanted a strong government. They wanted an executive that was so, so uh, energetic and capable that, that the Jeffersonians just said, George Washington wants a king. I mean, they literally said that. You guys are monarchists. I, I remember Antonin Scalia said, I got to meet him a couple times when I was a student, and he said, all you kids, you always focus on the Bill of Rights. You think the Bill of Rights is what guarantees your liberties and your, your way of life. Not even close. Every tin pot dictator in the world has a Bill of Rights. The thing that preserves your liberties are the institutions, the traditions. It reminds me of what Burke says in Reflections. He says that the state is to have recruits to its strength and remedies to its distempers. What is the use of discussing a man's abstract right to food or to medicine? 
The question is upon the method of procuring and administering them. In that deliberation, I shall always advise to call in the aid of the farmer and the physician rather than the professor of metaphysics. Right. Well, he, he's, he's assuming that experience is the ultimate true teacher. I mean, the farmer knows something about the way the world works. The physician knows something about the way the world works. But when he's talking about metaphysicians, he's talking about liberal philosophers. Mm -hmm. he's, he's basically talking about, uh, about people like Payne and Jefferson. And he's saying, you know, th their theories are, are completely disconnected from, th they just have nothing to do with the way things really work. So it's nice to say, you know, everyone in the world should be free. But if you don't have traditions that make it possible, then, then, then you're not gonna have freedom here. People say, you know, freedom of speech is a natural right. You know, everybody's, you know, free, naturally free, and, and so they ought to be able to just speak. But anybody who's raised kids knows that there is no natural inclination or natural right to, to free speech. The only way that kids learn free speech is through year after year after year of, wait your turn, wait your turn. I, I, and then they, they get upset, they storm out of the room, you bring them back to the table, let him talk, listen to what he has to say. The training that, the training that we get in being able to conduct free speech, that training is the actual source of the freedom, Burke would say. Not some right that you came up with, it's the training that's the source of the freedom. And, and just look at America, where, where people are less and less trained mm. in conducting free speech, and the right is disappearing. What about all these natural rights that I'm told that we have? Or is this to say that there is no role for rights in Burke's thought, beyond just the conventions and the laws and the traditions? You know, he, he, Burke definitely does not want to deny that, that there are such things. Basically, what he says is that they're not, they're not really relevant for, for achieving anything good. In other words, his claim is not um, that, you know, it, it's not that there's, uh, he's not trying to say there is no right to, to, uh, to not be murdered or to not have your property stolen. Of course, there's a, a right to not be murdered and to not have your property stolen. The, the, the problem is that if you start there, all right, I, I, I'm gonna begin with the right to not have my property stolen. You can reach almost any conclusion. Why? Because the, the definition of the right is completely, uh, it's completely open. And, 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 and people, you know, Marx comes along and he says, sure, I, 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 I believe in such a right. The, the right to not have your property stolen is the right to not have the government decide that there's property at all. And all these people <laughs> run around and say, look, Marx has a better interpretation of the, 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 of, of the liberty, yeah. right? I mean, problem solved. You can't yeah, have your property yeah, stolen problem, if you don't have any. The problem is that a lot of, a lot of conservatives, they don't, they don't take that seriously and say, oh, Marx's view is stupid. What they don't understand is that it, if you're not focused on working out a tradition of what exactly do you mean by property and what exactly are you making illegal? What, what are the conditions and circumstances? All of these, if you're not working that out, you're not actually trying to defend that right. That, that's basically what Burke is saying. And B Burke makes an important, really basic point about property in here, which is he says, the power of perpetuating our property in our families is one of the most valuable and interesting circumstances belonging to it, and that which tends the most to the perpetuation of society itself. So he's not even arguing in the abstract about, the, about what property means. He's, he's arguing in a very particular way. When we have stuff and we want to leave stuff to our kids, we're, we're going to probably be a little more careful with it and with the society that protects it. Right. It's a really basic argument. It's a very basic argument. And note, notice that his arguments are always empirical. He's always looking at society and saying, look, this is the way it really works. He's never beginning with some, some theory and asserting it. He's always beginning with, take a look at hundreds of years of, of the way this has worked in our country. Look how well it works. But the, the classical liberals, who I guess we would contrast with Burke here, the classical liberals always get credit for looking empirically at society and coming up with the empirical observations that will guide uh, our political communities. But they have a totally different approach than Burke does. Yeah, it, the, 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 the claim that the classical liberals are empiricists is... is uh, uh, bogus. It's bogus. It's a, the, I mean, it, it, it's true that uh, John Stuart Mill 
um, uh, in the uh, uh, mid 19th century looks back at a couple of hundred years of liberal theory, which was all of these abstractions that Burke is attacking. And Mill says, well, you know, Burke was actually right um, about the fact that you can't get anywhere with these deductions. And he does try to reconstruct liberalism on an empirical basis. But the, the, the easiest way to understand this tradition is Burke is uh, 300 years after a, a, after a guy named John Fortescue. John Fortescue is the, f the first person who wrote in, uh, a book called uh, in, in Praise of the Laws of England. And in Praise of the Laws of England, he defends imp on an empirical basis. He says, look, our government just works better than the French or the German. And he says, why does it work better? It works better because of the separation of powers. It works better because of checks and balances. It looks better because the, the right to property is sacred and the English king is by law not allowed to enter the home of, of the, the most humble uh, uh, a farmer and to take something that's not his. And he says, our freedoms are based on property. Now, all of these arguments, Burke is reading them in, in a book that's already 300 years old. And he's saying, these are our English traditions. Everybody in the world knows that they're better than other people's. So, so why would you want to throw that tradition away? And then the classical liberals come along and say, ah, look, we have a reason to throw it away because tradition isn't reliable. They don't believe in tradition. Yeah. We want to use pure reason. We're going to figure out the absolute universal truth. And then what they do is they, they, they look at everything that's good about England because of its traditions, and they say, well, we're going to reason about it. And then we'll use reason in order to come to the absolute conclusion that we throw the traditions away and we'll have reason. And that's what America looks like now, is we used reason and we threw all the traditions away. And guess what? <laughs> it's it, all gone to pot. It, it's all gone. <laughs> Well, so probably the most famous passage from this book is one that is not divorced from reason. I don't think it's unreasonable, but it's not focused on the abstract ideas. And it's a passage about the Queen of France. And Burke says that he, he went and he, he saw the Queen of France. He says, it is now 16 or 17 years since I saw the Queen of France, then the Dauphiness at Versailles, and surely never lighted on this orb, which she hardly seemed to touch a more delightful vision. I saw her just above the horizon, decorating and cheering the elevated sphere she just began to move in, glittering like the morning star, full of life and splendor and joy. Oh, what a revolution, and what a heart must I have to contemplate without emotion that elevation and that fall. Little did I dream when she added titles of veneration to those of enthusiastic, distant, respectful love that she should ever be obliged to carry the sharp antidote against disgrace concealed in that bosom because Marie Antoinette would be attacked by the mob and ultimately she, she doesn't have a very happy ending. Right. And he says, I thought 10,000 swords must have leapt from their scabbards to avenge even a look that threatened her with insult. 10,000 swords to leap in a nation of cavaliers and gallant men but the age of chivalry is gone, that of sophisters, economists, and calculators has succeeded, and the glory of Europe is extinguished forever. A little dramatic, wouldn't you say? I think what he's getting at, I mean, it, it, it is something really important, which is that um, there is such a thing as honor. It, honor is the, 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 the weight that you give to someone who is uh, who is above you, you know, your parents, uh, uh, your, 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 your teachers, your military commanders, the president of the United States. But that would require us to acknowledge that there are hierarchies, yes. that we actually have obligations to certain people. You know, in, right in the, the very next passage, Burke says, and this always rankles people's feathers, even some conservatives, says, never, never more shall we behold that generous loyalty to rank and sex, that proud submission, that dignified obedience that subordination of the heart, which kept alive, even in servitude itself, the spirit of an exalted freedom, the unbought grace of life, the cheap defense of nations, the nurse of manly sentiment and heroic enterprise is gone. A liberty, a freedom in servitude, in submission, how are we supposed to make sense of that? I think you can experience it still today. I mean, if you, uh, when, when a child, um, especially a rebellious teenager, goes to uh, to, uh, to his mother and says, is there something I can do to help? Right? And his mother says, I'm so glad you asked. Yes, could, could you do the following things? And then he does them. You know what he feels? He feels liberation. Hmm. 
He feels libera- he feels he feels a freedom, and that the freedom comes from the fact that what he's doing is he's advancing his mother. He's advancing someone who belongs to him, who's tied tied to him in, as you say, in a hierarchy. A person who helps someone who's higher than him or her in a hierarchy, when they help and when it when that help is effective, the the feeling that they have in their chests is a feeling of freedom. A, a, a soldier who uh, gets a difficult command for, from his commanding officer and is told to go capture the hill and he obeys and he does it, the, the feeling of capturing the hill isn't, hey, wow, you know, I'm so good at this, I captured the hill. The feeling is I've upheld the, the, the need of this military force mm. that my commander entrusted with me and that feeling is in fact a feeling of freedom. And these conservatives know that, that when you're low on the totem pole, you can feel free by helping people you believe in, helping move them up. And as you get older, as you get older, as you get more experience, as you rise in a hierarchical society, you then have these other younger people who come and help you. They feel free free by helping you. These are things that, that we've lost, but they're very basic human things. Because Burke acknowledges this even on the idea, I'm not sure if I have the quote on hand. I've got too many quotes. The the man is every three pages, he's got a great quote. But it's about how if we have this obsession, this focus on equality and equalizing everyone, we're not going to equalize people. We're going to level the whole society. And it's not going to build anyone up. It's just going to knock everybody down. There's a problem with the word equality. The problem is that, that there is a strong truth to it. I I mean, going all the way back to the Bible, the idea of equality before the law. A judge is not allowed to discriminate because one of the parties is poor or rich or a man or a woman or or, or anything. You're supposed to, justice justice involves equality. That's on the one hand. But on the other hand, um, a child is never, ever the equal to his his parents. A soldier is never the equal to his, his commander. And so what happens is, when you turn abstract equality into this kind of absolute thing that applies everywhere, you cease to be able to think in terms of hierarchies. You cease to be able to think in terms of, you know, what do I owe people, right and wrong? Equality is is crucial because it teaches us things like uh, you shouldn't shouldn't judge on the basis of somebody's skin color. But equality is destructive if you think that equality means that you're going to grow up and be the equal of your parents. You're not. It seems that the only people who don't understand this are the uh, self-fashioned intellectuals, I guess. You know, uh, Roger Scruton, the late conservative philosopher, had this idea that the job of the conservative intellectual is to articulate the things that ordinary people know instinctively. <laughs> so <laughs> regular old people, they just kind of get it. They know it. Right. And then you get the, I don't know, these sort of liberal, high and mighty intellectuals, and they just completely throw out common sense. And so the job of the conservative intellectuals is to say, no, actually, the common man kind of has it. Uh, Burke makes this point, a direct affront, I believe, to Ben Shapiro, which is that Burke says that men are generally of untaught feelings. Feelings don't care about your facts, is what, what Edmund Burke <laughs> is saying. But this is, this is not to throw out facts and reality and truth, but it is to say feeling really does matter in politics. You use the, the expression common sense uh, or, or sensibilities, Adam Smith would say. Th- sentiments, Hume would say. All these words mean uh, that when you're raised properly, you have feelings that, that, that are the guardrails. They tell you when you've gone too far. Hmm. The expression God-fearing in, in the Jewish and Christian tradition, that, that's what it means. It means you have a feeling for when you've gone too far. And that feeling protects you from, uh, you know, from getting, on, getting on Twitter and uh, abusing people who, are, have, uh, uh, who know more than you do and express, uh, uh, cursing out people because they said the wrong thing. The, Common sense used to prevent that, mm. and that was about feelings, it was. It was about the feeling that you've gone too far. And if you wanna see what happens when a society throws out its traditions, mm. just throws them all out, levels them all, what you get is nobody has any guardrails. Nobody has any feelings telling them when they've gone too far. And the irony, of course, is that their ideas and their behavior 
eventually become quite unreasonable. When you throw yeah. out the limits and the guardrails, reason will, will undermine itself. So if Edmund Burke has shown us, because this is, theoretically, this is about France, but it's really about England, and frankly, it's really about us, right? Yep. It's really about how we think of our political community. Yep. Then what are we supposed to do? We, we, we are in a really tough state. The common sense, the traditions, the, the natural sentiments that people have, the traditional sentiments that people have, have all been thrown out the window. The society is coarser, it's uglier, doesn't even know the difference between a man and a woman, for goodness sakes. And on top of that, you've got the liberals pushing for their crazy liberalism, and half the time you've got conservatives pushing for a form of liberalism. How are we supposed to recover hmm. some semblance of a conservative tradition? As you say, we're in a bad place, America and, and all, all of the, the, the Western countries with it. That place is, is one where the, uh, the parts of society where traditions are actively being handed down are increasingly small. But you can actually reconnect with them. I mean, mostly, mostly it's at this point uh, Orthodox, Christian, and Jewish congregations, and not even all of them. But it's still possible if, uh, if an individual man or woman or, or a couple or a family, if they're sick of the, uh, the constant breakdown and the, the annual creation of new rights which are just used in order to destroy people, you know, to destroy other people by taking away their rights, if you're tired of this and you actually want to learn what the great tradition had to say to you, you're not gonna learn it from books. You know, it, it's, it's nice taking classes about it, but, but a conservative life is something that is available if you're willing to, uh, to look for a community. I'm talking about a, a religious congregation and, and the, the families around it that are still handing down the old traditions. It, it, it exists and you can find them, you just need to wanna to do it. But in order to learn from them, to understand what it is that they're teaching, you can't read about it in a book. To understand what they're teaching, you have to be willing to give them honor. You have to be willing to say, we're not equal. I'm not their equal. Mm. They know something that I don't know. And I'm gonna learn it by giving them honor. And by giving them honor, I, I open myself up to beginning to understand how it is that they are capable of uh, maintaining uh, the, the, not just the respect, the, the love, the honor, even, even the, you know, the glowing adulation that you're quoting from Burke, for things that do deserve it, that's still alive in, in these communities. And you yep. can find it and you can join it. And we can, we can turn our own desires that way. I mean, we, we joke about this glowing part about Marie Antoinette and you know, never right. lighted on this orb. But what he is demonstrating here is not just some cold, abstract reasoning. He's demonstrating love. He's demonstrating that there is some dignity here that he admires, that he feels some loyalty to. Uh, why do I love my country? I, you know, I just love it. I don't, I mean, I like the ideas, but I just, it's my country, darn it. It's my family and it's my community and, and it's my wife and it's my, and I, so I love these things. And that is, uh, that, that's much deeper than just a, a little manifesto you can write down on a napkin. But you can, you can start here. You can start with Reflections on the Revolution of France. You can start with Edmund Burke and then you got to put it into action. Until next time, I'm Michael Knowles. Thank you so much to Yoram for uh, joining me. You're welcome. And pleasure. we will see you next time on The Book Club. Thank you so much for watching this episode of The Book Club on PragerU. PragerU is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, so we rely on donations from viewers like you to keep this content on the air. Please consider making a tax-deductible contribution today to help keep this content coming. Thank you very much.